once in a while, am I in God's will? Am I living out God's purpose for my life? We need to be asking ourselves that question every once in a while. Am I right smack dab in the middle of where God wants me? Can he use me right where I am? The answer is yes. And, of course, you're at Bible class tonight, and that is absolutely God's will for your life. And so we're going to look at some characters here that are out of God's will, that have gotten away from God's plan for their life, and we can see the destruction that happens. We looked at last week, we looked at angels and their respect for authority. And we looked at Michael's refusal to curse Satan, to speak evil of him, or even to uh, beat him up, as though it were. Even though he had the strength to do so, he did not. In verse 10, Jude goes on to uh, characterize the apostate uh, generation, the false prophets, but these speak evil whatever they do not know. These speak evil of whatever they do not know. We're going to have two different categories. The first category here is going to be people speaking about things they don't even know. So we're going to talk about the ignorant. Think The people who speak evil of things they do not know And then the second category is going to be people who know, but distort. It says, but these people speak evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know, these are the informed. Naturally, what do they know naturally? It is from the soul, it's from um, people on earth, like brute beasts, and these things they corrupt themselves. And so the unbelievers here, if they do not resort to doctrine, guess what? They're going to resort to uh, animal instinct. Isn't it amazing now that you see a lot of people being tattooed up? and it's um, Tattoos are always a part of an apostate generation because uh, even if you look at when the Jews came out of Egypt, God said to them, don't dress yourself up like the Egyptians. Don't shave your face. Uh, the Egyptians had a special way of shaving, uh, and God said, don't shave your beards like them. Don't try to look like them. They're heathen. They had to have no information about God, and they're worshiping demons. Don't don't try to be like them. And the Egyptians, they tattooed their bodies, and God said, don't tattoo your bodies like the heathen. And so we see many people now are going in for tattoos, and that's fine. In the church age, uh, there's no restriction against that. All I simply have to say is usually when you get into the the, the people that have the tattoos all over their body, it's a part of heathenism, and we see that throughout history. So we see people, they're tattooing their bodies up, and a lot of them look like animals. I don't know if you've seen these people, they tattoo their body, their skin up, look like a leopard. A lot of them have animal tattoos on their bodies, worshiping the wolves or the dragons or uh, all kinds of of animals and uh, dogs and uh, all kinds of things like that. And the Bible here, it shows that when people reduce themselves down to the base instinct, they're like a brute beast. It, uh, isn't it amazing? In, in America right now, we have a problem with wild animals. In other parts of the world, people don't even understand it. They don't understand how vast our land is and how much wilderness we have. But did you know what the number one source of erosion is in America? It's not farming. You say, well, it's these fields that they're plowing up when it rains, all the topsoil is going away. It's not that. It's not even flooding. You say, well, the floods, you know, they wash all the topsoil down. They're taking it down into the ocean. It's not even that. Do you know what the number one problem with the is in the United States? Wild hogs. Wild hogs are the number one problem we have with the erosion of the soil. 
And we have millions of them, millions and millions of them. They hide in the brook. They love it where it's thick at. And we can't kill enough of them. They're multiplying faster than we can kill them as hunters. And uh, you talk to people overseas, well, we hunt. They say, we hunt. And they say, I can't believe you killed a helpless animal. Look here. If we didn't kill the helpless animals, they'd overtake us. If we didn't have whitetail hunters, you couldn't drive down the interstate, friend. You'd total a car out once a month hitting all the deer. You couldn't go anywhere. And so hunting keeps the animals in numbers. You know what Jude says? He says, these people who lower themselves to animal instincts, they're like brute beasts, and they're made for destruction. Flip over to Second Peter. Second Peter, this is a parallel passage. Second Peter chapter 2. You have to go over towards uh, the front of your New Testament. Second Peter chapter 2, in verse 12. I believe Peter and Jude got together when they were writing these uh, letters to the uh, churches, the believing Jews. Now, they didn't have to. The Holy Spirit could have led them to write the same thing. But this is a parallel passage that we have over in Peter. It says, but these, these are the apostates, like natural brute beasts. These are like wild hogs made to be caught up and destroyed. They speak evil of things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption. And so we see, uh, did you know the law says that unlike a deer, a hunter that kills, uh, that kills a wild hog, did you know it's legal to just kill them and leave them laying? It is legal to shoot them and just leave them laying out in the woods. Because there are so many of them, it is a injustice not to shoot them. And uh, they're destroying, uh, they're not a natural species to America. They were hauled over here by the Spanish. They're evasive. And they're destroying crops. They're destroying timberland. They're destroying uh, all kinds of habitat. They eat the food that our natural uh, game species eat. And so the law says we've got to do something about the problem, and hunters are the best solution. And uh, the law says that you can shoot them and you don't have to harvest the meat. You can leave them uh, to rot right where they are. Well, the false prophets, the false teachers are the same. They're made to be destroyed, the Bible says, and God will destroy them. And uh, it's amazing that these false teachers mostly are believers that will die to sin unto death. Like brute beasts, in these things they corrupt themselves. Go on to verse 11. It says, Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain. I want you to look at the story of Cain. We're going to have three different characters here. We're going to have Cain we're going to have Balaam, and we're going to have Korah. And it shows these people, and it relates their lives to apostasy. We're going to look at the story of Cain. Genesis 4. Genesis 4, the story begins with Adam and Eve. Now, Adam and Eve sinned, and Adam sinned. He plunged the whole human race into uh, spiritual death when he sinned. But Jesus Christ there, he showed them the gospel. He killed an animal. He clothed them with the skin from that animal. They believed. They were born again. And now we see here Adam and Eve, they're married still. And Adam is going to um, know his wife. Here's something interesting. Did you know God gave Adam and Eve sex way before they had babies? 
Yes, he did. Jesus Christ gave Adam and Eve sex as the as the first marriage gift. But now, after the fall, sex is going to have new meaning. And it says, now Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. And so Cain is the first son of the human race and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, and this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of fruit of the ground of the Lord. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, angry and his countenance fell. And so we see here the story of Cain and Abel. There is a protocol when you're dealing with God, and there's a protocol in the spiritual life. And Abel followed the protocol. Now, it just happened that Cain, his living was tilling the ground. He was a farmer. He was a gardener. And he wanted to bring the work of his hands to the Lord. But that didn't follow the protocol. See, the Lord was looking for a baby lamb because it represented the spiritual death that Christ would die on the cross. And Abel brought a gift to the Lord, and it looked forward. It was a shadow of Christ to come. Cain's offering was that fruit of the ground, and it, it, it did not meet the protocol. And so we see that Cain... Here, being in unbelief, he goes into human good. Kind of like Eve sowing the fig leaves together. And so Cain took his offering, but his offering was not accepted. Verse 6, So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, Sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. See, if Cain had used his volition in the proper way and made an offering, if he had believed in the coming Christ, he would have changed there. He would have turned away from human good and done the right thing. Verse 8. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. This is the first murder of the human race. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Sarcasm, he answered God with. And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, shall, you shall be on earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear it. And so we see here that Cain was punished for the murder of Abel. What I want to do with you is after we've read the story, I want you to look at the doctrine of Cain with me. We're going to take down some points on the doctrine of Cain, and we'll look at some points of this story we have read from Genesis 4. Point number one, Cain was the first baby of the human race. Cain was the first baby of the human race. I have to think that Mama spoiled him. Maybe she didn't know how to whip him yet. No, Cain, pow, don't do that. we got to teach our kids how to mind sometime because, you know, they're going to run out in front of a car in front of the Walmart parking lot, and you're going to have to say, hey, stop. 
You can't get a hand on them. If they don't mind, guess what happens? Crunch. They get run over. You've got to teach your kids to mind at some point. They're going to get hurt. Don't run out in the highway. Hey, stop. Guess what happens if they don't listen? They get hurt. Don't touch that. They get hurt. And so I have the feeling that Cain got a little spoiling because, you know, a lot of times when you're a parent, you don't really learn how to discipline until you get that second kid in the door. You say, okay, this is too much. We can't handle all this. We're going to get this straight. And so I have a feeling that Cain might have been the firstborn, and he probably got raised by Mama. He probably cried a lot. Dad probably went out of the house and said, I'm going to the garden to work. You can take care of that kid. Adam, once again, didn't do his job, showing discipline. So Cain was the first baby of the human race. We're going to see that his lack of discipline and training in the home is going to cause him a lot of problems. He was a mama's boy. Cain was a religious legalist. You know, the biggest problem that's ever happened to man is religion. Religion is man's attempt to gain the approbation of God by human works. In other words, man is going to do something to make God happy. Man, by man's work, is going to seek to please God. He's going to do something from his own being to somehow gain God's favor. And we see this in Cain. Cain was religious. A religious legalist and all kinds of legalism is going on in the world today. They followed the way of Cain. That's, a, that's come from our verse. In Jude, Cain was, first of all, he was a religious legalist. Genesis 4, 3. When you try to get saved by doing anything other than having faith alone and Christ alone, you follow the way of Cain. In religious legalism. Approbation lust cannot stand rejection. Approbation lust is that form of lust which seeks the approval of man or God. See, they want to get patted on the back. They want somebody to tell them, you're so good, or you're so sweet, or you did so good. you got to have that all the time when you have approbation lust, or you're feeling left out. You're feeling sorry for yourself unless somebody's patting you on the back and saying, good job. Well, guess what, friend? Get out of that. Get out of that. You'll be a miserable person. You go with this deal. Oh, misery. You don't need anybody to pat you on the back and tell you good job. Do you think anybody patted Jesus on the back when he made a, a whip and chased the money changers out of the temple and flipped their tables over and whooped them? Do you think anybody said, wow, you're so sweet, Jesus? You're so sweet. No. No, it, yeah, I'm sure his disciples were standing around with their jaws open. So don't worry about approbation, love. We need to do what God has planned for our lives, and don't worry about man. Religion sponsors mental attitude sin. This is the most miserable type of people. They're trying to make God happy with the works. They're trying to make people happy, trying to gain their approbation. Now, here's what happens. You go to the church full of religion, and they say, we need somebody, we need new songbooks. And if you'll sponsor songbooks, we'll put your name in there inside the songbook. And we need Sunday school rooms. We need to we need to re renovate our Sunday school wing. And if you'll give to this, we'll put your name tag 
right outside the hallway. This will be your room. We'll put a brass plate right out there. Put your name on it. And we need to build a convention center, a family life center, and we need to spend a million dollars building a complex where everybody can come in and do something you could do somewhere else. Play basketball, swim, walk, whatever it is. And we'll put your name on that front of that building if you'll help us build that. Well, you end up giving because you want your name on the door. You want your name in the book. You want your name on the building. So everyone can see your name. And you're going to say, wow, I'll have all the approbation I need for that. Wrong motivation, friend. We give out of grace. Jesus says, don't even let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Don't do works in front of man. He says, pray in secret. Give in secret. And when your name doesn't go in the songbook, what happens? My name's not in there, Pastor. And I gave X amount of dollars. I'm mad. I'm leaving. I'm going to another church. They'll give me attention. My name's out on a Sunday school room. Oh, that's because somebody else gave a little more than you did. <laughs> well, you got your feathers wet, and now you're all rustled up, and you're going somewhere else. That'll pay me more. Time. It goes on and on, friend. And it, you get these religious churches. Guess they've got a huge rotation. And it's the people that were nice to me. The people were so nice to me. So I stayed here. And so religion sponsors mental attitude sins. Now, point number five says becoming a part of the target. Religion has a target. And guess what? Religion attacks grace every time. You can put that in your notes. Religious legalism attacks grace. So when you're a grace man or a grace woman, guess what you've done? You painted an X on your back. And when the legalist doesn't get what they want and they become bitter and sour, look, guess what happens? They look for a place to unload at. And with the X on your back, you become a prime candidate for attack. Now you're you're the target, friend. Just think about Jesus. He became a part of all the religious legalists, the Pharisees. And when you become a grace person, you're going to become the target. Religion attacks grace. Point number six, a bully for God's blessing. The religious legalist believes that he can bully God around and make his own set of rules for what the spiritual life is. When the Bible has clearly given us, in our age, the mystery doctrine. We know what the spiritual life is because it's outlined in mystery doctrine. Well, Cain... He's going to set his own rules. He's going to bring in some real nice tomatoes and some real nice jalapenos and some real nice onions and a little bit of garlic and a little bit of, what's the little spice that they might not talk with? Cilantro. All these things. Sure. And say, Jesus is going to have some hot tamale. I'm going to give him all the ingredients here. See, he's going to come up with his own game plan. But God's protocol system said that it must be a firstborn male lamb without spot and without blemish. And we don't know that Cain may have rejected the idea of killing an animal. We have many people today that reject the idea of killing anything. And... That's fine. If you don't want to think about that, that's fine. A lot of that's normal because it's harsh and sometimes it's tough. And 
Some people can't handle that. But the truth is that the Old Testament sacrifices showed the slaying of an animal because it was graphic in nature. And it spoke of the graphic nature of Christ's death, the spiritual death. And so Payne says, no, I'm not going to kill an animal. I don't want to see that. I'm going to come up with my own system for God's blessing. And this is why the, the religious legalist is now. They're going to come up with their own system to uh, for God's blessing. I heard somebody say the other day, well, you just got to love everybody. Just like they were going to go up and just hug and just float around and just hug and just love everyone. Just sap, the sap was just going to flow out of them just right around the subject and they were just going to turn them into Christians by love. Well, agape love is not sap. It is freedom for another person's volition. And uh, it's more mechanical than it is sappy, and they didn't understand the concept. Well, guess what? They had set up their own system in order to be blessed by God, and it won't work. You've got protocol in the Christian way of life, and it's a precisely correct procedure. The road of Cain is a long road of misery, and so when you pursue religious legalism, you're in approbation lust, you're guaranteed a miserable life. The most miserable people I've ever seen in my life are people who want to be recognized. You know what they eventually do? They eventually do this to get recognized. Hoping that somebody will come by and pat them. They will sit around and they'll whine and they'll cry and they want somebody to come up you know what I'm going to do? What's wrong with you? They love that. Well, this well why, why don't you apply this truth to that situation and perk up? You see, they say, well, that's tough. Did you know sweetness is the character flaw? The colonel taught me that. So let's look at some points. We understand that Adam was in charge of teaching Bible doctrine to his family. And we know that Abel learned doctrine, so obviously he was teaching something. But we understand that Cain rejected the teaching of his father in Bible class. We know Adam taught the inherent law. It was a spoken law. It was passed on from generation to generation. So that's going to be your first problem in life. Two young ladies, your biggest problems are going to be in life when you quit going to Bible class. Go ahead and put that down. When you quit taping, when you quit getting any doctrine, that's when your largest problems will come around. And Cain rejected the idea of being taught anything by his father. He's a mama's boy. He said, well, daddy doesn't have anything to teach me. I'm going to listen to mama. She talks about fig leaves. He had his own idea of what was acceptable to God. And just like the people nowadays that are religious, they have their own ideas about what makes them acceptable to God. They say tithing makes them acceptable. They say speaking in tongues makes them acceptable. They say being baptized makes them acceptable. Do you know the biggest part of the uh, people I talk to, uh, a lot of young people that are Baptists, they say, well, I was raised in the church. That don't make you acceptable to God. I was raised, I go to my granddaddy's church. That does not make you acceptable to God. And so we need to get in there and teach him about the gospel. Cain got into inordinate competition with his brother. He couldn't stand to be beat affected by his brother, which God seemed to be pleased with his offering. The stipulation is that fire came down from heaven and 
devoured the offering that gave uh, Abel gave. I heard this before. And Cain's offering was left. Instead of changing his mind, he developed hardness of heart. And so many times we find ourselves wrong. I found myself wrong many times, dreadfully wrong. I've done things I wish I could go back and change. But you know what? Now I know better, and I've changed the way I do things. So there are points in our Christian way of life where we learn a new doctrine. We learn that we didn't handle it in the past right. Guess what we need to do? Accept our failures and move on. Don't become bitter over it. Here's something funny that people do. When they fail, and they fail miserably, they look around for somebody to blame. My daughter does this. She fall down. She's going to get up and look around and see if anybody's around to blame it on. Man. No, nobody around. Well, Cain, he looked for a scape rope, and he found a target, and it was the grace man, Abel. So he projected his failures onto Abel, and then he attacked him there. Your religion always attacks Christ. You got that in your mind. Remember this also. Satan is the father of murder. He's the murderer from the beginning, the Bible says. And so violence is natural to Satan. Isn't it amazing that Cain couldn't kill the baby lamb, the little lamb, but he could kill his brother. So I've got some points of summary in closing. These are just random. It shows the progression of some of the mental attitude sins of Cain, first of all, his rejection of Bible doctrine. When we reject Bible doctrine, we put ourselves in a serious predicament in life. And then we see the mental attitude and attitude sin of jealousy. Jealousy is a terrible sin. Jealousy says, I'm not happy with what God has given me. See, that's the opposite of thankfulness and humility. Jealousy is a terrible sin. Jealousy is what promotes socialism, what we have in America today. How come I don't have what they have? Well, look what God has given you. Jealousy turned into bitterness. Remember, bitterness is a root that comes up and it grows out of the soul. God says we ought to chop it out. Revenge. I'll tell you, I'm going to get somebody, see? I'm going to get them back. And even if somebody wrongs you in the Christian way of life, guess what? There's no getting back. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And he knows how to take care of it. Projection. We see that Cain projected his own inadequacies onto his brother and attacked them there. And that's my next point. Assassination. Your blood, his blood cries out to me from the ground. And so I've got a final statement. I don't know if you want to copy this or not. It says, 
Intense concentration on self-importance. Guess what? That's half the world. Half the world is so intensely concentrated on their own self-importance. There's a lot of photos now on the internet. It's called selfies. I kind of think it, it's kind of peculiar. Is that, hmm, intense concentration on self? A lot of it is. That's fine to take your self-portrait. It's what's in your soul that matters. But intense concentration on self-importance makes failures unbearable. See, you take yourself too seriously is what happens. you got to take yourself in a light of candor at some point because you're imperfect, friend. You are imperfect. Cain couldn't stand his failure. They were unbearable. In order to deal with failures, they're projected onto another and destroyed there. And so Cain's target became Abel, the grace man. He couldn't stand the idea of being rejected. And he killed his brother there in the field. So it says the false prophets, the false teachers, have gone the way of Cain. They pursued religious legalism. And to that extent, they're going to be destroyed. So we all get the idea out of this learning about Cain that grace is the way and grace is the means and grace is what we ought to be pursuing. And when the Bible says grow and in the, in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it means to get rid of the religious legalism in our life. I want to thank you for your attention and attendance.